Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Monday, April 25th, 2022. And today we are joined by Jesse Weber, a former trademark and copyright litigator who serves as a legal consultant and commentator on Fox News and HLN, in addition to his full-time gig as an anchor on the Law and Crime Network. Jesse, welcome. Good to be with you, Josh. I don't know if it's Josh or Joshua. I don't know what you like to go by, but I'm going to go with Josh. How's that? Josh is perfect. Josh is perfect. Uh, We've got a lot to cover today, but before we jump in, Jesse, you have a, a really interesting story on how you got started. Could you tell us a little bit about what eventually Uh, led you to being on the Law and Crime Network? Sure, yeah, I have a little bit of a roundabout history. So yes, I am an attorney. I did litigation. I did intellectual property. I worked for a very large law firm. And while it was a great experience and practicing law was a really great learning experience, I decided I wanted to do something else. I found my calling that I wanted to be in front of people instead of a computer screen. So I actually left my law firm after several years of practice and went to acting school I enrolled in the uh, Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. I did a one-year conservatory program, did commercials, short films. I was actually in The Loudest Voice with Russell Crowe on Showtime. I was in a scene with him. I played a reporter, asked him some questions. And, okay. But I always really wanted to be a host. I wanted to be a broadcaster. So I was doing hits with Fox News, CNN, CBS, all these things. And I realized uh, that I heard about this company called, uh, it was called Law News at the time. And it was started by Dan Abrams from ABC News. And they were covering new court trials. This is before Court TV relaunched. So it was like the only network doing this. And it was covering live court trials. I went in there as a guest. They asked me back a couple of times. I said, hey, listen, I don't know if you guys are looking for hosts, but I'd love to throw my hat in the mix. They said, yes. I auditioned and I got the job. Emerged and it became the Law and Crime Network. Um, and I became their morning host, 9 to 12. Um, I did a, from there with Law and Crime, I actually uh, executive produced and hosted a nationally syndicated show for them called Prime Crime, covering big cases. So that I did, and then I've done live reporting for them for the Harvey Weinstein trial and out in Johnny Depp in Virginia. So I've done a number of things with them. I've been there for, for about five years. But on top of that, I do a number of other different hosting gigs. So I'm an anchor on News 12, News 12 Long Island, Westchester. Um, I also am a fill in anchor on Sirius XM. I do the POTUS channel, all political. I fill in for some big names there. I have a radio show with my father called Always in Fashion. That's on 710 WOR. We talk business, fashion, lifestyle, a little bit of law. So whenever I have an opportunity to get into hosting or anchoring or reporting or anything like that, I jump at it. It's not the career that everyone has followed, but it's my career and it's uh, been a great one so far. That's fantastic. You are hustling. I love it. You're all over the place. And you're You've been inside the courtroom on the Depp and Heard trial, which we're going to talk about a little bit later today. So I'm sure uh, uh, listeners are going to be very curious to hear your thoughts on actually being inside the courtroom. Uh, But before we get into that, there was a huge verdict that came out last week in the Dr. William Husel trial. This is in Grove City, Ohio. He was found not guilty after facing 14 counts of murder for his treatment of ICU patients at Mount Carmel Hospital. These deaths were related to an alleged overprescription of fentanyl and other drugs. The jury deliberated for nearly six days, yet didn't find the doctor guilty of a single count. Pharmacists who work with Husserl served as witnesses for the prosecution and mentioned initially thinking that the large doses were clerical errors, but still verified the orders after confirming the size of the doses. The defense stated it was an important moment for patient care and the future of ICU doctors and nurses. It is unclear what the future will be for Dr. Husel. He also has a pending case against Mount Carmel, and he could also be uh, there could also be further fallout uh, from the 23 nurses and pharmacists and managers who were fired by the hospital system. It was really a shakeup over there. Uh, And Mount Carmel has already reached settlements totaling over 16.7 million for the deaths of over 17 patients with further cases pending. Uh, Jesse, I know this was one of the cases that you and law and crime had been following uh, closely. Was this verdict surprising to you? What are your thoughts? I don't mean to toot my own horn. I really don't. Um, (laughs) But I predicted this from the very beginning of this case. And that is not to downplay the tragedy of this. I mean, this is 
14 people died. By the way, this case usually was originally about 28 patients. Uh, they narrowed it down to 14 to really hone in on the people who were, the prosecution said, were given even the highest amounts of fentanyl. Uh, it's not to downplay that this is a tragedy for, for all those families and still have probably a lot of questions out there about what happened to their loved ones. But from a legal point of view, this felt like a very legally shaky and weak case for the prosecution. And anybody who was following this would have really gotten us, uh, would have understood that after the opening statements, particularly by Jose Baez, because this was a situation where it was never, and I watched the whole trial, it was never clear to me when you had terminally ill patients, okay, arguably terminally ill patients, the prosecution tried to say they could have possibly been saved. These were very sick individuals who were really at the end stages of their life. And it's, it seemed to me very difficult to prove causation, how they actually died. The Mount Carmel West didn't have an order in place about a limit on fentanyl, which I thought was a big problem for the prosecution. You're second guessing a doctor's orders. And that's, there's a reason we've really never seen a case like this before. I, I was a bit nervous. You know, if he was found guilty, what would have been the ramifications for doctors moving forward? Um, but I, you know, there were red flags. There were things that I didn't necessarily understand what Husel did. I, I think there was a, an extreme lack of communication on his part with the families in terms of what he was about to prescribe and what the effects would be. But at the end of the day, issues of causation and particularly intent, it never sold to me that this was a doctor who intended to murder these patients. And at the end of the day, that's what the jury was tasked with deciding if he was going to murder them or attempted murder. It still needed intent. And particularly when you had testimony that he was trying to save them at different points in their life, and then he's going to make the unilateral decision in, in front of everybody. He didn't do It's not like he snuck into their rooms and injected them. He incorporated hospital staff to do this. It just never flew for me the causation and intent elements for him to be convicted. Not saying it couldn't have happened. Again, I feel terrible for these families. Not saying there weren't mistakes. I think there probably were mistakes at that hospital. But to rise to the level of murder, I didn't see it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you make several excellent points. I, I agree with everything that you're saying. One, one thing that always stood out to me was the prosecution formed their entire case just based upon the dosage, right? They, I think they made a cutoff of about a thousand micrograms of fentanyl. And they said anything, you know, at that point and above, we're just going to go ahead and call murder. Well, my my question was always, if that's so high that it's to the point of criminal liability, why wasn't he arrested on patient number one? I mean, why this this hospital knew that this was taking place. There were there were several people involved. Like you said, he didn't sneak in with a syringe and inject these people. There's several people who get involved in every decision he was making. And no one is is pushing the alarm button. Nobody's saying, hey, this is way outside the bounds of care. It was just seen as kind of on the higher end and kind of on uh, on the fringe of what they would consider care. But no one is saying immediately that this was murder. And the other thing that stood out to me is what you pointed out about intent. And we've talked about this before, that the prosecution doesn't have to prove motive. Fine. But in a case like this, if you don't give them a reason why this doctor would, like you said, ruin his reputation to murder people, and people who were all already close to death, why? What does he have to gain? What is what would be his reason for putting everything on the line to take these people's lives, other than him being a complete sociopath, which we just didn't see any evidence of? I I I, I feel like, and maybe this is the question I have: Do you think this case was a non-starter to begin with, or did the prosecution? blow it or was there just was there something they could have done different or was this the best case they had it's always easy playing you know monday morning quarterback right. and i'll tell you right. the judge in this case um judge holbrook actually after the verdict he pulled the jurors and they said that the case was a bit too complicated for them from the prosecution's point of view i didn't really see that I i'm not going to hit the prosecution here in the sense that i didn't see them do anything wrong i actually think they put on as best of a case as they could have, they had the number of victims. I think their strongest evidence was the time frame from the administration of the drugs to when these people died, some of them mere minutes. And so if you had a question about causation, you could say, well, it seems like the drugs uh, accelerated the death. But at, at the end of the day, when, when you have this kind of case with these kind of facts and circumstances, 
it just didn't seem to me to be a winning case. I think, again, I, I will say, I understand why they brought it. Okay. I don't, I'm not hitting on them for doing it. I, I understand that they have multiple families who were left in the dark here and weren't communicated. Everybody in that position would be angry. There was one witness who was the widow of a patient who was clearly very angry on the stand and said, he killed my husband. That's it. She'll believe that no matter what the jury ultimately says, and I don't blame her. But from a legal point of view, it just didn't seem to be beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed murder. And those, that term, it's something we throw out a lot beyond the, reasonable, beyond the reasonable doubt. When you really break it down, it's not just if you have a little doubt. It's not just if, if you think he did it, sure. Or if he might have done it, sure. It's beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed murder or attempted murder. It was just too high of a bar. Now, if they would have charged him with something less, maybe the civil arena, that's a very different area. That's a very different area for him, very different area for the hospital. Um, but when you're talking about the criminal arena, I, I just didn't see it as a winning case. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to see uh, kind of the ripple effect from those civil cases because there's still more coming. The hospital's already paid out so much. But I agree with you. Your heart goes out to these families. No one wants to hear that their loved one, uh, even, you know, their life was cut short by even a matter of moments. So no one wants to hear that. But at the same time, from a legal perspective, like you point out, I just don't think this this case ever had it to begin with. And, and by the um, way, Josh, sorry to interrupt. I mean, for, no. for William Husel, Dr. Husel, I mean, who is ever going to want to be treated by him? Yeah. His life has changed forever. Yeah. It doesn't matter the outcome of this. So if you wanted to bring awareness to it, great case to bring awareness to problems. And maybe there'll be more open and further communication between doctors and patients, families, which yeah. I think is the only silver lining of this case. And I think that's absolutely what you will see, because if you are an ICU doctor and you've been watching this case, you were thinking, I am not risking my career over something. I want nine people signing off on everything I do. I think you're right. The, the one kind of good to come out of all of this might be some better communication and oversight in these, these types of um, ICU environments. Moving on to uh, another case that I know you've been following closely, to totally switching gears. We're talking about the Rust Production was issued a maximum willful citation. This is out of Bonanza City, New Mexico. I love that name. This is the first uh, penalty uh, faced in the onset death of Helena Hutchins during the production of the film Rust. New Mexico Occupational Health and Safety Bureau said in a press release, and, and listen to this quote, Management knew that firearm safety procedures were not being followed on set and demonstrated plain indifference to employee safety by failing to review work practices and take corrective action. That is a scathing quote from them. Uh, they found the production had violated multiple standardized uh, industry safety guidelines, including ammunition should never be brought on any studio lot or stage. Daily safety meetings should take place for the handling of firearms. Employees must refrain from pointing a firearm at anyone except after consultation with the prop master, armorer, or safety representative. And this is notable because the armorer was reportedly not on the church set in which the shooting occurred. Uh, OSHA noted that the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, was not provided adequate time or resources to perform her job despite her voiced concerns. Wow, to all of this. Uh, how do you think this finding, this citation impacts the future uh, civil case? We'll talk about that first, uh, it, 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 pending against the Rust production. So I think this is huge for civil cases filed against the producers or even Dave Halls, who was, I mean, obliterated in this report. I mean, this was the guy who allegedly handed the weapon to Alec Baldwin and if you are the producers or you are Dave Halls, you'd be sweating a little bit because whatever lawsuit comes about or whatever, continue, this goes to trial, this report is going to play a major role. So I think if you're them, this is only going to hurt you. Now, I know the producers are appealing this decision. We'll see if that's successful moving forward. If you are the armor, Miss Reed, this is a great thing for you because you are saying that you did everything you could do and yet you were being forced and torn into all different directions, but yet you warned production, this is creating an unsafe working environment. So this is a big win for her camp and I know she's already uh, filed a lawsuit as well. Alec Baldwin's interesting. So from this report, I kind of look at it as if 
neither here or there. Now, obviously, they're not putting a lot of blame on him. They said his responsibilities were an actor and kind of this more creative producer in, sense, in terms of like the storyline. He wasn't there checking the props. You know, he wasn't there right, in terms of right. cutting costs. I don't necessarily think it's the end of the, 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 the end all be all for him. I still think there could be a legal claim, obviously wrongful death against Alec Baldwin. He was the one who allegedly opened fire. I know he says the gun kind of went off. That is going to be an issue later on. Criminal charges for Alec Baldwin still up in the air. Again, he is the one who fired it. I, I think this is a, a report that could ha- maybe um, not play a significant role in whether or not he's charged. I think it could be play a significant role in whether or not Dave Halls is possibly charged with some kind of criminally negligent uh, crime there. It, it's an interesting uh, development in this case when you have a government, and I want to make it clear, this is not me going out there and reporting on this. This is not me going out there investigating. This is a, an agency that spent, I think, 1,500 hours and dedicated immense amount of time and resources to this. So to have this report and have a conclusion about what happened, this is not a good position for the producers or Dave Halls. And, and I think it's a really important factor that's going to play a big role in the years to come. Yeah, yeah. The, you mentioned the criminal uh, case. So, so take off your civil hat, put on your criminal hat. It's we still don't have a decision. This is a long time for pending criminal charges uh, to be to be waiting. Um, first, I mean, I know you're reading tea leaves here, but first, why do you think it's taking so long? And do you think this new report moves the needle? I think that this is a really tough case, and I think it's a really difficult one from both a legal perspective and a political perspective. OK, uh, to charge Alec Baldwin with this would have really big ramifications for the movie industry, and maybe rightfully so. But I think it's also a legally questionable case where we deal with situations where you acting negligently, or was this a complete accident? That's the law right there. I can't tell you how many cases we've covered where we ask this question. Was this a crime or was this an accident? There's still some more information that there's there's need to glean from what happened that day. I know there was a whole back and forth with Alec Baldwin actually giving over his phone and, and, and trying to understand his intent there. And, you know, people watched the ABC interview and they were saying, how does a gun just go off? You know, I, I'll tell you this. I filled in on POTUS. Um, I was filling in for Dan Abrams on his Dan Abrams live show. And I did a show on this after the ABC interview calls for an entire hour from people, from experts, people who play, who've trained with guns, people who haven't trained with guns, excuse me, people who have trained with guns in different arenas, some saying the gun can go off, some saying it's impossible for the gun to go off. They need a clear answer as to what exactly happened in that church, and I don't think they have it. They also have to be very strategic about how they charge this crime because you as you and everybody knows that you don't just charge someone to charge someone. You charge when you, you indict when you, or you seek an indictment when you are trying to be, when you know you can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not if you just think he did something illegal. It's you have to know he did something illegal. And it's not a clear cut case. Um, If I were Alec Baldwin, I wouldn't be doing any more interviews. I don't think that (laughs) interview helped him too much. I would try to stay silent, have his lawyers speak for him and see where it goes. But I'm not surprised it's taken this long because, again, we're still in a fact finding mission. OSHA just released this report, which could play a big role in any criminal case. Yeah, no, you make a good point. I. I think what's happening, too, is you've got this small county who has the biggest case they have ever seen and probably ever will see. And you're absolutely right. It's not just about do you charge Alec Baldwin, but if you charge him and that doesn't resolve in some sort of conviction of some sort, whether that's through a plea deal or through a trial. Now you look, you've got egg all over your face, right? You you yeah. cannot bring a case this large and not feel that you can absolutely prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think there's a lot of hand wringing going on in that county, uh, uh, you know, by decision makers on what to do on this type of thing. It's going to be interesting. Uh, and I hope we get results soon, um, but it will be really interesting to see how it all pans out. Josh, let me ask you real quick, I, your yeah. opinion. What, do you think there could be a disagreement between the sheriff's office and the prosecutors? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think you see that a lot in these these bigger cases. I think, you know, not to be so kind of um, stereotypical about it, but I think you you see the law enforcement, meaning sheriff's departments being a lot more hard charging and they want it. They want to kind of get the guy, as it were. Right. 
uh, you know, not in our county. And then you've got the DAs who are elected people too, right? They're thinking about this from a political uh, 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 angle as well. And they're probably the ones kind of going, let's all just hold on for a second here and really make sure that we make the right decision because we don't want to embarrass ourselves if we bring this big of a prosecution. I think yeah. that absolutely could be going on. Yeah. Yeah. We're just reading the tea leaves here the best we can. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Uh, changing gears again. Uh, we're talking about a, a really awful case that took place. Um, but Ariel Maynard was given four life sentences in Beverly Hills for the killing of Jacqueline Avant, an 81 year old ph philanthropist and wife of music executive Clarence Avant, who was also known as the godfather of black music, working with many black artists as a manager and record executive. Um, the shooting took place during a burglary attempt in the couple's Beverly Hills home. Maynard uh, then reportedly shot himself in the foot after the murder while trying to flee from a second armed robbery, this time at a Hollywood Hills home. Uh, during sentencing, prosecutors played phone calls from jail in which uh, Maynard laughed about the killing. Uh, this case uh, really captured a lot of headlines here in Los Angeles, but it also resonated across the country because it's highlighting this overall rise in crime that we see, and especially in cases dealing with residential burglaries gone bad. We see uh, um, a whole string of what we're now calling these follow home uh, robberies where people are just driving home and somebody follows them into their gate at their you know luxury uh, uh, home and and uh, you know armed robbery type of thing so it's really kind of hitting home with a lot of people i, I guess is the way you could look at it um you jesse you live in, in new york correct mm -hmm, i do tell us about the effects of rising crime that you have seen locally and then just in your coverage of crime across the u.s what are the, what are your thoughts well, I mean, look, it, it, it's been happening for a while, but obviously the pandemic accelerated it. And we live in, I live in Manhattan. It is not the same city that it was before the pandemic. I mean, I, the, the level of hate crimes you're seeing, the level of people who are getting mugged on the street for their watches, it's really sick and disturbing stuff. I think there's a number of reasons why that happened. Uh, one of them, I mean, you, I don't care where you stand on this. You have to agree that the anti-police sentiment clearly had an effect. It, it did. Um, you saw numbers of police officers who just left the force or, or are nervous to take action uh, based on, you know, different uh, tragedies that have happened. And I think that's a big factor. And then a change in laws, you know, a change in laws where you let minor crimes slide or you don't get punished for minor crimes. Or you don't get, uh, you get released for minor crimes. I mean, we have Alvin Bragg, who is highly controversial here in New York uh, for his policy on low level offenders. And you're seeing it. You're seeing a rise of crime in big cities and people are nervous. I, I can't tell you enough. People are not operating the same way that they used to. They are nervous. I see it on the streets. I see the real world effect of it. Um, and, and it's a disturbing thing. It's an unfortunate thing. I thought perhaps with the end of the pandemic in sight, or uh, you know, maybe things are opening up, people are coming back to their offices, maybe we'd see things change. I haven't. And to give you a little bit of a circumstance of this, in the height of the pandemic, have you ever seen The Dark Knight Rises? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember the scene at the end when all the police are lined up on one side of the, the Gotham and the other, the criminals are on the other side? So I was right. walking home one night and literally on Sixth Avenue, police all along the left side, and now, by the way, this is like in the heart of pandemic, there was like no car. So you see all these police and then literally gunshots in the West side. I'm not even kidding. You. I heard gunshots and I'm like, I'm in the middle of this right now. I'm like trying to, so I went more East to get out of it. But the point is, is we're in a different kind of world, a different kind of environment. And we're seeing this level of crime that is highly, highly unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. You, you remind me of a story. I, you know, as a defense lawyer, I'm in contact with law enforcement all the time. I used to be a prosecutor, so I have many friends who are in, in police officers. And I was talking to one of them recently um, and I was just asking, you know, what, how has this affected this whole kind of defund the police movement and and the, the, the incredible kind of s scrutiny that they're under for any action that they take, good or bad? Um, and how has that affected policing? And he told me a story about how him and his partner were in a car. They got a radio call for a commercial burglary. So we're talking about like a storefront late at night. Somebody had broken in and they go lights and sirens out to find it. Then they get an update saying suspects on scene. 
And he said they turned off their lights and sirens and they took their time because it, this was the incredible decision they had to make before they would have proactively gone to try to find those people who had broken in. Now, the confrontation is not worth it to them. They would rather them get away, deal with the aftermath. You know, hopefully insurance takes care of the, the store. But this kind of proactive policing and, and I know a lot of people are going to criticize that and say they should have done their do job. But at the same time, they want to go home to their wife and kids, right? They don't want to see their careers end. They don't want to get shot themselves or have the last thing a police officer wants to do is to ever have to pull his weapon. And now they're thinking, I don't even want to put myself in a position where that's a potential. And it just it, you reminded me of it. It's just a remarkable uh, time that we live in now. Do you think we're we're turning a corner though? Are things going to ever return back to kind of normal, quote unquote? Well, well, well look, I, and I, I don't want to be very clear about this. Nobody wants to see another George Floyd. Nobody wants to see another situation with uh, Jacob Blake or anything that happened with Kim Potter. Nobody wants to see that. Those are really bad instances and tragedies that happen. And, and you know, the case of Derek Chauvin, obviously criminal. I, do I think it's going to turn the corner? I, I don't know. I, I think there needs to be a change in the public opinion of it. You know, everybody, there is a conversation to have about defund the police. I get it. The other alternative is, do you need to devote more time and resources and money to police departments for better training and, and be able to handle these crisis situations and not enter into a panic mode and be able to do your job and do your job effectively? I, I think there's a strong conversation that needs to be had there, but not in a way where you have the extremes yelling at each other. That might be the answer. I hope things change because it, it is not, you know, I have, uh, I have two nephews and they grew up in New York City. They moved out to Long Island. But when they grew up, you know, years ago, it was you know, my sister-in-law would push the, the carriage. I was still nervous about her being on the street, but, you know, it, it felt safe. I saw police everywhere. Now I wouldn't want her to do it. It's just a very different environment and world. Hopefully there'll be a change. But your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. No, I, I think we have to have some sort of change. And the change is certainly not in, like you said, this defund the police thing, because the, the rise in crime is just hurting way too many people. And it's across all demographics, all, you know, I don't care, rich or poor, it, it's hitting everyone. And, and it's, it's just not sustainable. Something has to be done. And, and by um, the way, there's, good, there's still more criticisms of, oh, you know, progressive d district attorneys. I mean, Alvin right. Bragg is not popular here for a reason. Right. And there's yeah. a reason for the people are pushing back. Yeah, we, we've got George Gascon out here in Los yep. Angeles, who's under a, a recall campaign that is, has a mounting kind of uh, motivation, uh, uh, momentum, I mean, behind it. Uh, it looks like it actually might happen. People are this is a person who was just elected two years ago and people are done They They don't like to see they like to hear about reform and they like to see change but not when it comes at the expense of people being hurt. And I think that's what we're seeing. And, and he um, was controversial because right in this very case that you mentioned, he made it seem like, yeah, we're going to go after Maynard. We're going to put him away. Yeah. But originally, like, I think it was a police organization that said that was, or maybe it was the DA's association who said he was never on board with this. He wouldn't have right. let this happen. Right. No, I, mean, no. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. It's, the, the irony was he had this press conference kind of taking risk taking uh, all the kudos for for the sentencing and under his guidelines, it never would have happened. It's, it's right. It, it, right. People are starting to really pay attention and and that's not good for him. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens. This is the case we've all been waiting for. You've been in the courtroom. We're talking about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. This is the landmark defamation suit filed by the actor against his former wife. Depp claims that the Washington Post essay that Heard wrote about domestic abuse harmed his career and reputation. A couple of things to keep in mind. Depp is never mentioned by name in the uh, the opinion piece. Uh, Depp reportedly lost his role in the lucrative Pirates of the Caribbean franchise because of the fallout from the article. And last week, we heard audio recordings played in court of Amber admitting to hitting Johnny. The audio also revealed the couple's highly publicized Australia fight, we'll call it, in which Johnny's finger was severed. Uh, and during the audio, you can hear he makes several attempts to remove himself and de-escalate the situation while Heard is trying to, in my opinion, continue the conversation to settle the dispute. So, Jesse, you've been inside the courtroom um, for much of this. Tell us, what is it like? I mean, what is what is the atmosphere like inside there? It's surreal. 
Uh, <laughs> let me let me tell you specifically when he took the stand, there was complete silence in that courtroom. I mean, the jury was watching him like a hawk. All of us were just you could hear a pin drop in that courtroom. We were waiting for every word he had to say. The overall experience is pretty incredible because you have people in that courtroom who are pro Amber supporters, pro Johnny supporters, people who are just interested in the case. And then if there's room, the media, right? And, right. and it just feels like people have so many opinions of this case one way or another going into it. They're not trying to find an answer. They're just there to support. No matter what the end conclusion is in the case, they're going to feel one way or another about this. And, and I find it fascinating. It's in Fairfax, Virginia, not LA, not in New York. It, it, it's like you take this big case and you bring it there and there are people who have followed it, but it kind of feels like in the middle of nowhere doing this. And what was fascinating about it is the lines outside to get into the courtroom, I would get there every day about 7.30 a.m. and had no problem getting a ticket. As soon as Johnny Depp started taking the stand, I had to get there at 6 a.m. to get a ticket because the <laughs> line was so long to ultimately get in. It, it's incredible to be a part of it. Um, I, I think it's amazing to see this kind of legal case. It's also a really disturbing case. You know, as much as we talk about the celebrity aspect of it, to hear the back and forth between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard is just so disheartening and, and disturbing. Um, but to see him on the stand in the witness box, as opposed to the big screen, I can't believe we're watching it. Yeah, no, it, it is. You, you make a good point. It, it's, they, it was so to toxic, a relationship. There were so many demons that they're battling with. It, it, it was so sad that you, you know, you see these celebrity type people and we all kind of think they've got the world on a string, right? And they private jets and parties and text messages with Elton John and all this stuff. And they're living very troubled lives sometimes. I mean, there's there's some photographs of him kind of passed out in the corner and and you the 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 alcohol and substance abuse that he was going through. It's really kind of sad stuff. The thing that's been remarkable to me is he does have this this gravitas about him. He does have this ability to kind of you said it was silent when he took the stand. He has an ability that you can hear the the courtroom reacting to comments he makes you know something funny and everybody's kind of laughing they're just hanging on his every word one thing i'm i'm curious a couple of things i'm curious about to hear your thoughts on but one is what do you think about the back and forth between johnny depp and herd's attorney it became very combative at, at, at certain points um i've seen a lot of trials in that 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 seemed like two people kind of going after each other and Johnny's, you know, kind of giving it back to him just as much as he's taking it. Do what do you think though from a strategic legal point of view? Is this working for the her team or working for the Depp team? You so his name is Jay Benjamin Rottenborn, and yeah. Depp does not miss an opportunity to really emphasize that name. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Rottenborn. Look, I, I, I think first of all, I will tell you that. For Johnny Depp, he never came off as angry on the stand. And that was important because he's basically being accused of being an angry, wild lunatic. He seemed to be, he doesn't seem to know, there, there were parts of it where he seemed to want to explain himself more, but he's not allowed to because that's not the nature of the question that he was being asked. And he wants to further expand upon it, and he can't. He was, he seemed to be, as much as there were times that he seemed to not be in control, he also did seem to be in control. He wouldn't miss an opportunity to make a comical remark. And at the end of the day, I've said this before, I will say it again, Johnny Depp is not only trying to convince that jury of his defamation claim, he's also trying to convince the American public. That's who he's speaking to also. He's trying to rehabilitate his career. Now, it's surprising I say that considering he brought this case and all of his dirty laundry, all of the text messages, all of the audio recordings, the videotapes, he knew they were coming in. He's obviously going to try to explain it and twist it you know, into the narrative he wants. It's just bad. It doesn't look great for him just from a, a PR perspective. But on the other hand, I, when you speak to people who are watching this day in, day out, they feel, and I'll tell you, I feel the same way, he seemed very credible and honest. You know, the, Obviously, there are questions about, did he actually cut his finger or did Amber Heard cut his finger? Sure. But what stood out to me more than anything is how relatable and real he seemed, because this is a guy who said on the stand, I can you know, reiterate 100 words a minute if I'm doing a character, but that's not who I am. He was significantly struggling for words at times, and he was very careful, deliberate, and made a concerted effort to pick the right words when he was speaking. And for me, it came off as very reasonable. Now, I will tell you, and very relatable, but I will tell you, he is so close to that jury. I know you can't see it on air, but... 
he's right next to them. And there's times he's speaking right to them, to them. They see him like they're, they're not taking their eyes off of them. I know he's an entertainer. I know he's an actor. People say he's made doing a performance. I didn't see that. So from that point of view, I think he handled himself as best as he could under cross-examination. Having said that, my opinion, the cross-examination was pretty bad to his case. You know, that's how I look at it. Particularly, it wasn't clear to me that he's really suing for the article or is he really suing for everything that she said in the past and how much that article really did hurt him. On top of the fact that it least looks like he could have been engaged in psychological, verbal, mental, and possibly physical abuse of Amber Heard. And if the jury believes any of that, he would lose his defamation claim. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he I agree with you. I, I feel he, I find him to be authentic. I don't find him to be evas uh, evasive. I don't find him to be kind of deceitful. He's, he's being honest about all the, all the ugliness um, and I think it's coming across as very authentic because I think it is authentic. I think he he is telling us the truth as as he remembers it. I had a little more criticism of of Rottenborn uh, in that I think he I don't think they're playing this the right way when it comes to the kind of substance abuse and alcohol. People don't hate Johnny Depp, right? That he hasn't been given permission by Johnny Depp to really go after him. Johnny Depp's been, been respectful. He's been answering his questions. He's been polite. And so there's no real excuse yet to really go after him. And when he makes these kind of jabs about, you know, him being passed out and it will, how could you even remember? And I know where they're trying to do strategically as far as attack his veracity because, you know, as it deals with his own memory. But you're dealing with somebody who's got, you know, a, a substance abuse, dealing with opioids. A lot of people have been, across this country are dealing with that problem. Perhaps even some members of the jury have family members or they themselves have dealt with that. And I think he was coming at him too strong on that one issue. Um, are the jurors watching Heard as well? Are they looking to her reaction when things are happening? So, so let me just address that one point if I yeah, can. Yeah, please. The, the two things I see about that. One, the more they can show that he had, the, and he's not denying it, but the more that they can show the substance abuse problem, one... They're trying to show he torpedoed his own career, that yeah. Amber Heard was there to help him. And the only one responsible for him not being in a future Pirates movie is his own behavior, his own actions, him destroying property, things like that. And Good the point. more they can create this unstable environment, even if he didn't hit her, you know, the video of him seemingly intoxicated in the early morning hours, smashing cabinets, kicking doors. We're not even fighting this morning. All I did was say sorry. Did something happen to you this morning? I don't think so. Um, no, that's the thing. You want to see crazy? I'll give you fucking crazy. That's crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this going. You got this going? I just started it. Oh, really? Yes. Really? That just they'll say is that was where she was living. That was her environment. That's what she was exposed to. That is mental abuse. You want to say that's what makes her the ability to write this article and say she's the survivor of domestic abuse, because that's it. That's what I think they're trying to do. Now, in terms of the jury, um, from what I have seen, I haven't really seen them look at Amber Heard. Their focus is on two things. It's mostly Johnny Depp. And by the way, this is I'm talking about him taking the stand. It's mostly Johnny Depp or the computer in front of them, their, their exhibits that they're shown. I've maybe seen one juror look into the gallery once, and I should note that some of the jurors also are wearing face masks due to COVID-19, but um, their focus is mostly on death. I don't see them looking at her that much. Interesting. Well, she's gonna take the, the stand herself reportedly soon, uh, perhaps this week, today, we're recording this on Monday, perhaps it even starts today, who knows? But um, it will be interesting to see how she does as well. Uh, is she going to be able to hold up? Because she's going to be under the same kind of cross-examination. And a lot of these video and audio and everything else are, are harmful to her case as well. I've got to put you on the spot here. But do you, are you, I know you're only calling balls and strikes. But who do you think is winning this thing so far? You want my honest opinion? Yeah, I do. I, I have a feeling they're both going to lose. I, I really do. I think this is going to be a washout. 
Um, for him, his case, there are legally pro- there are problem problems legally with his defamation claim. Everything from vague statements in the defamation art to the article about how it's actually defamatory. Um, and then I think there's weaknesses in her case because it seems very clear to me that she hit Johnny Depp. It seems very clear to me that she can't just say she wasn't an active participant in this. And, you know, allegations that she might have faked uh, injuries, which is what she's saying. She's saying Johnny lied about me about faking injuries. Well, we've heard some testimony so far talking about the fact that people didn't observe this, these injuries on her. People who were very close to this. And you, you could say they're cr- not credible or whatnot. But I mean, there was just an article that was released in the course of this trial. I don't know if you saw it. But the makeup company that she said she used to cover up her bruises, they released, a, I think, a, a video on TikTok saying the brand of makeup that she claimed she used to hide these bruises didn't come out at that time. So, so she's fighting a battle. And I think it's going to actually be tougher for her on the stand because the public sentiment right now, right, when it, to the people I speak of, don't believe her. They think they believe Johnny Depp. And she's going to have to show that, first of all, that she's credible, that she's relatable, but also that she would never in a million years claim to be a, an abuser for public gain, to be, to be a victim for public gain. I mean, that's a serious allegation from Johnny Depp's side, but she also has to show the ludicrousy of that, that I would never do that, that what, what do I have to gain for writing a fake article? What do I have to gain by saying I'm a victim of domestic abuse? So I think she's going to be put in the hot seat, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I personally think that her, his ca- claim, her counterclaim, they might wash each other out, and none of them would. No. If you probably are right. It's funny. I do. I do feel like just anecdotally, the public sentiment seems to be behind Johnny Depp. But people, I think, lose sight of the fact that we're not talking. This isn't the the case of domestic violence. And did Johnny do anything wrong? This is the case of defamation in one Washington Post article where his name is not even mentioned. People lose sight of that, and you, I think you might be absolutely right. They both, they both might uh, come out to be losers in this whole thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, not a, it's not about did he commit a crime. It's about did she lie about him. And from what we're seeing, everything this past two weeks, I mean, it's not looking great. You know, it's really not. And, and so I, I just think that it's, it, no, defamation cases are notoriously hard to prove. They're notoriously hard to prove with celebrities. And given some of the weaknesses in this case, it does make you wonder, is his goal really to try to win the legal case or win the hearts and minds of the American public to get his career back? Maybe that'll be the end result. And for her, I'm not surprised she's coming after him for $100 million, a counterclaim, because obviously she doesn't want to be painted as a, as a liar. And I'll tell you what, she's right to say that her career was hurt by Johnny Depp's allegations. That's how people view her. But it'll be up to a jury to decide ultimately her counterclaim and his claim. But um, I'll tell you, at the very least, we are getting a firsthand look at their dirty laundry. And that's the sad part about all of this. It was a really disturbing, toxic relationship that I'm not sure even at the end of this, will either anybody will really understand it. Yeah. Well, we will be following it closely uh, here and we'll be following you as you follow it daily. Uh, Jesse, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. So you can follow me on Twitter at Jesse Cord Weber. You can follow me on Instagram at Real J Weber. I'm on the Law and Crime Network um, every day if you want to watch. And also, of course, always in fashion, WOR 710. We're on iHeart. You can listen on uh, podcasts and uh, on News 12, HLN. Whenever you see me, I'll be on. But hopefully you're everybody all, tunes in. You're all over the place. I love it. And I'm your host, Josh I Ritter. You, I <laughs> you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.